it's a, a great pleasure for me to be giving uh, a talk in the Multilingual Mind series. Um, I, I would have loved to be in Constance giving that talk in person uh, because I've never visited the place, but, um, but um, maybe in the future at some point. Uh, so this work uh, is the result of a collaboration of a great number of people uh, that I'm going to mention uh, at the presentation uh, today is uh, a joint uh, adventure uh, between uh, Anusha who worked a lot on the on the data and she's working with us here in Cambridge uh, and myself. Okay, so um, the aim of uh, today's talk is um, to discuss the effect of multilingualism not only in individuals, which is the usual topic that we focus on, but also the effects of multilingualism in society and to what extent a multilingual society affects uh, multilingualism in the individual. And we're going to look at uh, these effects on cognition, but also on literacy. Uh, from the perspective of uh, uh, groups of children who come from a socioeconomically underprivileged context. So um, the focus of the research um, was in fact, I mean, although as Theo said, I was working on bilingualism before, um, in fact, for, for quite a few years, but all my work on bilingualism was in the global north. Uh, and uh, India was uh, a new adventure for, for me and the whole group, the whole Multilila uh, group, um, because we were looking at uh, uh, how to combine evidence and knowledge we have from bilingualism or multilingualism in the global north uh, to see how it, uh, it pertains to the global south. Now, in uh, Western societies, most of the studies, particularly on child multilingualism, consider um, factors like socioeconomic status, but the differences are usually um, associated with uh, parental education. And in fact, what has been shown is that uh, mother's education uh, seems to be the, the strongest predictor of uh, um, socioeconomic status. Uh, which is a proxy, really. You know, mother's education is a proxy for socioeconomic status, um, looking at the development of individual children. So this is something that is quite accepted uh, in, in the global north. Um, furthermore, when we're looking at Western societies, we know that educational provision and societal welfare and support are usually good. Uh, so there is a threshold, of course, and there is variation. But we start off from the assumption that the state is going to look after you know, um, uh, state education, for example, and, uh, and welfare. When we look at linguistic diversity uh, in the society, and the society is a Western society, we find that it is usually quite low or it is ignored in these studies. So what the context is surrounding the child, um, not the immediate context, the home, but the, the more, let's say, um, the larger context, which is the community, the school, uh, and the society, is usually ignored. Okay, so in the project that um, uh, we, uh, that Theo uh, talked about, the Multilila project, we address the question of multilingualism in, in school children in India. And India is, of course, part of the Global South, and it is a highly linguistically diverse society. Um, and the, the aim of this project was to, to look at the effects of multilingualism on children's cognitive and school skills. And as I said already, the focus here is on children who go to government schools, like state schools, and whose socioeconomic background is severely deprived. Okay? So we are looking at, some, uh, at the case of multilingualism. Um, which is, I think, in many ways, very different from what we see uh, in the Global North. And some background with, uh, you know, these are, these are the, the co-investigators, so this is the core team. Um, there are other people, um, consultants, partners, and uh, of course, a lot of uh, research associates and research assistants who contributed to this project. 
but uh, Theo and Janine were the people I worked with uh, uh, very closely to um, develop the, the project. Um, and at the time, we were all at the University of Reading. Um, and uh, the three uh, co-investigators from India, uh, Suvarna Aladi, who is a neurologist, uh, and she is from the National Institute for Mental Health and Neurosciences in, in Bangalore, um, she has expertise in um, um, bilingualism, but from the point of view of uh, um, cognitive uh, decline, let's say, and how, and dementia. Okay, so her expertise is in memory, um, and she's looking at bilinguals and monolinguals, um, suffering different types of, of uh, dementia. So she has expertise in cognitive control, and uh, that was one of the aspects of the project. Minati Panda is a, a psychologist with expertise in uh, school psychology and educational psychology, and she's in uh, Delhi at uh, JNU. And Lina Mukopadia is an applied linguist um, who works in the English and Foreign Languages University in Hyderabad. So without this team, uh, the Multilila project would not have happened. Uh, and so I'm I'm uh, I'm delighted that it has been brought successfully to, uh, to a close now. So um, looking at the background in terms of multilingualism in the society, uh, I need to introduce a little bit the diversity that you find in India. Um, so it is not an understatement to say that in India, multilingualism is the norm. Uh, I have to say that, you know, in, in, on average, uh, the adult uh, Indian speaker uh, would speak three or four languages, okay? And uh, in, in fact, uh, we have met um, people who speak many more of these languages. Not necessarily, they, they are not necessarily educated in these languages, in all these languages, but they're actually, um, this is quite common uh, in India to have this multilingual background. It is, as UNESCO points out, the, uh, it is uh, one of the most linguistically diverse countries in the world. Um, there are 22 languages that are recognized by the constitution. These are called scheduled languages. And they are, um, and these languages can be supported by the state uh, as mediums of instruction. That is, these are the languages that can be used as school languages in different parts of India. And in this case, they will be funded and supported by the state. Um, and there are 121 languages spoken by more than 10,000 people. There are different estimates about how many languages are spoken in India. Some of them go up to 1,000, some estimates. Um, in the ethnologue, what we have uh, in uh, 2018, uh, it's 462 different languages that are spoken in the country. Now, when you look at this linguistic diversity, um, from the point of view of education, you can see that obviously, as you expect, uh, the majority of uh, uh, classrooms are highly multilingual because there are high levels of internal migration within and between states. And this is true particularly in urban areas. So there are many internal migrants that move from different parts of the country into um, uh, cities in order to improve their living conditions, okay? So that means that classrooms, particularly in urban areas, uh, are very diverse, very uh, multilingual. And of course, uh, this is associated in an interesting way, which we need to disentangle, uh, with uh, the socioeconomic status, okay? Because internal migrants are usually coming from uh, deprived backgrounds, so moving into cities, um, they will usually move into, for example, slum uh, areas. Um, and of course, the children that go to school uh, in uh, schools that are close to slum areas are going to be children that speak many different languages. Okay, so multilingualism and linguistic diversity are very closely connected. And in a sense, they are also associated with um, uh, socioeconomic status when you are looking for differences in the country between urban and rural areas. 
Now, we also have, so this is the background about social linguistic diversity and multilingualism in India, but we need to know also how education works, so we get the background on, on education. Um, there are certain findings that have been replicated quite uh, in, in, many, in, in many different studies, in fact. Uh, about low learning outcomes in, uh, in uh, primary school children. So there is a major uh, non-government organization in India, which is called Pratham. And this has uh, the uh, ACER uh, tools and they perform ACER studies. ACER stands for Annual, Annual Status of Education Report. And they, uh, they conduct um, uh, assessments of literacy and numeracy on a yearly basis um, across children, in, particularly in rural India. Okay. And in their studies, they have found some uh, quite discouraging uh, results, which is that, for example, more than half of all children in year five primary school could not uh, read um, a text that is a year two level text. And almost half of them could not solve a year two level subtraction task. Now, these results are reported again and again. And um, in, in a sense, um, in, in our project, we found, we found a lot of variation in, in learning outcomes. So we found that it's not the case that all children uh, or half of the children uh, were unable to read the year two level text. But it is true that there is a lot of variation and the uh, variation unfortunately extends to uh, uh, very low levels, okay? So even children who were unable to read letters um, in years four and five. So um, the problem is with these educational uh, outcomes is that of course they have a knock-on effect on problem solving abilities and critical thinking uh, and of course, they um, they lead to dropouts, um, which is uh, a common problem, especially in uh, rural areas of India. And uh, this dropout rate seems to affect girls more than boys, as has been noted uh, in UNESCO's report before, but also in this uh, non-government organization Pratham uh, in various uh, reports. So this research, the Multi Lila project. Um, started uh, with the question, can we identify the causes of low learning outcomes of these children who live in such a multilingual country? And, and Theo and I and Janine, we were all coming from a, a background with a, a strong interest in uh, second language learning and bilingualism. And we thought that, you know, there is some evidence around, in fact, there's a lot of evidence around, that um, individuals who are bilingual or multilingual might actually have better attention and learning skills because they have some advantages in cognitive control. Now, I know this debate is actually very hot now and there is evidence that, you know, maybe it doesn't hold always or it may not hold at all that uh, bilinguals have an advantage. But coming from this context where you would expect to find an advantage, when you Put yourself as a researcher in a context where everyone is multilingual, okay, um, you, you ask yourself the question of why is it the case that these children in India who come from um, multilingual, in a multilingual society, do not benefit to the same degree as children in the global north uh, who may benefit from that in uh, cognitive control, for example, or learning skills. So uh, one of the questions we wanted to address, because we wanted to see whether multilingualism in the society actually translates into multilingualism in the schools as well, and you know what, what is it that makes uh, uh, children have these low learning outcomes that we just saw? So we looked at the medium of instruction question, because this is a very very uh, central question in India. You know, which language do you choose to use as an official language, official school language, um, with children that come from so many different uh, language backgrounds? So there is an influence of English that you would expect, of course, because of the history. 
And um, there was a gap, uh, at this, um, a gap between private and uh, government schools. So private schools would promise uh, English medium instruction. And what that means is uh, the children will have English textbooks, they will be assessed in English, and they will have English as the language of teaching. Whereas on the other hand, government schools used to teach in one of the Indian languages. Okay? It would be either the home language of the, of the children or the regional language, uh, which would be the majority language. Now, this um, split between private and government schools um, actually had, uh, was very closely correlated, as you can guess, with socioeconomic uh, differences, because children who had who came from uh, wealthier uh, backgrounds could afford to go to private schools and have English education, whereas government school children could not. So several state governments in India decided to actually switch uh, some of the uh, government schools in their area to English medium schools. Okay, so now you can find uh, both English medium and regional language schools in different states uh, in India. And you still have the private schools and a new type of, of private school, which are the low cost private schools. Those schools require a very small uh, fee um, for, um, so parents who come from relatively poor backgrounds uh, can afford to send their children to that. And the, the ambition of parents who do that is for their children to have English as a medium of instruction, so to have English education. So um, now the question is, you know, we're looking just at government schools, which was the aim of our project. Um, we find a split between those schools that have English medium and those that have regional language medium. And uh, the intention from the point of view of the state government was to offer English medium in order to address the social inequities. I mean, why should only rich children have access to um, English medium instruction and not children from disadvantaged backgrounds? So the intention was good, but the question is whether the outcome is actually what they wanted to get. So we are asking the question, is this the right way to go? In fact, it's not just uh, one division between English medium versus regional language. There is a double divide uh, issue that Ajit Mohanty has, uh, has put forward in a lot of his work and in his recent book. And that arises from, partly from education and from the medium of instruction. So you get the divide between those that go to English medium versus regional language schools. But then you also have a further divide which is between a regional language, an Indian language, which is a regional language, and a language which is a minority language that is not a scheduled language and is not going to be offered as a medium of instruction. So the question is when you focus on the children and the languages they come with when they um, start school, um, we want to question you know, the, the, uh, the choice here, because really the choice is between English and regional language and the minority language is usually not supported, okay? So the question is which children, which uh, learners suffer more disadvantages in this context of the double divide? So um, there are a lot of studies, many of them from uh, Minati Panda, who was, as you saw, one of the co-investigators, and Ajit Mohanty, who was a consultant in our project, that show that uh, multilingualism is indeed the norm, but the proficiency that the child has in the home language depends a lot on whether education includes that home language or not, or whether education shifts the language uh, dominance of the child straight away. So in the Multilila project, um, we asked whether children who learn through the medium of a language, which is not the same as their home language, uh, whether they have different learning outcomes than those children whose home and school languages are the same. I know that most of you would think that obviously the answer is that those that have the same school and home language are doing better. But uh, in any case, we wanted to see the evidence um, for ourselves. Okay, there are other realities of education in India that one has to take uh, into account when trying to understand the low learning outcomes 
uh, that I presented uh, a little bit, a little while ago. So um, there are, in India, many of the classrooms have um, uh, too many children in them. So you can get an average of 40 to 50 children in a class. Um, there are poor resources in government schools and the pedagogy is really teacher-centered. So there isn't much interaction between uh, teachers and learners, both because that's the tradition and, uh, but also because uh, it is practically very difficult uh, if you have such a large class to um, encourage interaction uh, in your lesson. The other problem is that critical thinking is not really prioritized and there is limited creativity or expression of independent thought and this has been shown in different studies, um, studies that were conducted before Mantilila. Also, uh, another uh, issue in, uh, in um, Indian classrooms is that you get children who are above the age uh, that they are expected to be uh, for that class. And um, as you will see in our data, you can have a range of ages within the same year of schooling. Uh, and of course, uh, the question here is whether that has positive or negative effects, both for the children who are over age, but also uh, for the whole class. And uh, Alcott and Rose have actually argued that you can find both um, in this context, both positive and negative effects. Now, what is the role of English? Um, well, English uh, is a very uh, dominant language in, in India. Um, it is a way, in people's mind, a way to improve one's socioeconomic position. And that is reflected a lot in, uh, in the way parents uh, envisage education for their children. So they want uh, English as early as year one or even um, year three or even at year one and English as a medium of instruction because they think this is the way in which you can develop academic English and have better chances for education and a better future. Now, there are several problems with this uh, assumption um, that um, you know, various levels of society have, including, of course, parents, is that you know, in many cases, English uh, is very low among teachers. So they, the teachers cannot support English as the medium of instruction, but they're, they are asked to use English as the medium of instruction. And of course, when you're looking at children from uh, underprivileged um, backgrounds, there is a limited uh, resource, there are limited resources at home and literacy support in many cases is not available. So many of the children that we actually uh, assess in our study were what we call uh, first generation learners, which means that there is no literacy support at home because the parents were not themselves educated. So um, because of all that, English medium instruction in many cases is only in name and the actual teaching takes place in the regional or the local languages, as you will see in a minute. So um, let me just show to you uh, some of the uh, data from classroom observations that we did um, because we wanted to be able to see whether um, the reality of the language uh, use in classroom is different from the official language that the school uh, was supposed to use. So we used an observation tool, um, which is, um, well, one part of it is what you actually see here on, your, on, the, on the screen. Um, so you have, uh, uh, we were looking for teacher activity coding and the responses uh, of the children, so their activities. And then we had language codes. So what we did is we, we presented, we had the, the classroom observed for 30 minutes and within each of the five minute slots, um, the observer should uh, record the activity of the teacher the child activity, but also the languages that were used during these activities, both by the teacher and by the children, okay? And so we have information which is quite rich uh, in terms of um, the language used in the classroom, the activities, and whether it comes from the child or from the teacher. 
Now, our field work was not, of course, across India, but it was in three sites. It was in Delhi, which is the, the capital of India. It is a highly urban uh, site. Uh, Hindi is the, major, the majority language there. And it is, of course, Hindi is also one of the link languages in India. And schools in Delhi were officially either English or Hindi medium. Okay, so government schools, all of them. Then we uh, were in another urban site, which is Hyderabad, which is the capital of Telangana, of this state here. Uh, the majority language is Telugu, okay? And the schools can be either uh, English medium or Telugu medium. And finally, the third site that we looked at was uh, Patna, which is the capital of Bihar. Uh, Bihar is one of the most um, disadvantaged states in India. Uh, so, um, it is, in fact, Patna is considered not a city, but a town, okay? Uh, and um, it is rural, just outside Patna, it's actually considered a, a rural uh, area. So um, Hindi is the regional language in, in uh, Bihar. Um, the population is quite poor and the schools were only Hindi medium. There was no uh, English medium school there. So if we look, considering the observation tool that we have, and we look at uh, what actually happens in the classroom. So we start with Delhi, and you can see here that these are uh, English medium schools. These are supposed to be English medium schools, right? And what you find is that within the observations, this is across observations, you know, the mean across observations, and we observed, I forgot to say, we observed mathematics classes and English language classes. And what we find is that um, Hindi, a quarter of the time it, it's Hindi alone that is used, and the rest of the time it is a mix of Hindi and English, okay? And that's the teacher language. And when you look at the learner language, you see that the pie chart is becoming more colorful, right? So you have 50% Hindi use, you get a little bit of English only, okay? And then you get language mixing. And teachers do a lot more language mixing than, than uh, learners, okay? But what is important is that this is an English medium school and we found no five minute interval in the classroom observation where English only was used, okay? It was always either mixed with Hindi or no English at all. When you look at Hindi medium schools, okay, so the other type of school that we saw in, in Delhi, actually the picture is not very different from the English medium, right? So you still have Hindi, a bit more than in the English medium, Hindi alone, but you also get language mixing between Hindi and English. When you look at the children in, in that school, uh, in these schools, the, the Hindi medium schools, you see that in the, uh, most of the time they would use Hindi on its own, a very little bit of English and some language mixing, okay? So we can actually see a difference between English medium and Hindi medium in that in the Hindi medium schools, language mixing is a bit lower, but teachers mix more uh, the languages than, uh, than the learners, than the children. When we look at uh, the schools, the English medium schools in Hyderabad, what we find is that there is a lot more English here, okay? So you get 42% of, of English, you get uh, a bit of Telugu, which is the regional language, and uh, quite a lot of language mixing. And similarly, with the learners, you also find English used on its own, Telugu, and language mixing, okay? And this is part of no language spoken uh, as uh, interaction or reaction, okay? So um, again, we see that although the official language is English, you know, there's a lot more going on in the classroom than uh, English only. Similarly, in Telugu medium schools, you find that um, Telugu is used 38% of the time, English is used 20% of the time, although it's a Telugu medium school, and language mixing is going on as well. So um, to summarize, you can see, you can't see much of a difference between Telugu medium schools, the use of language in Telugu medium schools and English medium schools in Hyderabad, all right? 
So language mixing is, let's say, the norm, okay? And there is some use of uh, individual languages uh, used uh, on their own. So you can actually see the discrepancy between imposing a monolingual um, uh, system of education in a context where both teachers and children are multilingual, okay? The actual use of language in the class is uh, multilingual, so it's more than one language that is used. Here I abstract away from, from the, the, the specific numbers. I'm just giving you an idea about what uh, the total data size was for, for our project. So we had from Delhi and Hyderabad, we tested the same children twice in the year, when they were in year four and year five. Whereas in Patna, we could not do that. So we tested, uh, it was a cross-sectional sample. So we tested 450 children uh, from each of, the, of these two years. So we have a total of 2,500 participants. And each of them was uh, tested uh, for these children twice uh, during the project on uh, literacy, narratives, numeracy, mathematical reasoning, and cognitive tasks. It was a total of 14 tasks. And we have, uh, excluding the questionnaires that we use, and we have uh, uh, this total number of data points. And um, yeah, we've, we are still struggling to uh, put them in order, but okay, we've done some of that already. So let me just uh, address two uh, questions from all these data that I would like to, to focus on today. Um, so the first is the question of how is children's literacy affected by multilingualism and by medium of instruction? So um, the focus here would be on English literacy, but also regional language literacy, Hindi and Telugu. Uh, and the second question is, how is children's cognitive performance affected by multilingualism in the child and social linguistic diversity in the context where the child grows up? So starting with literacy, um, we get, uh, we are going to focus on decoding and reading comprehension, and we're going to look at the effects of uh, the medium of instruction on literacy performance, uh, whether the child is a minority language speaker or a speaker of the majority language. Uh, we're going to look at the uh, site, okay? So we're going to look at the three sites. Now for this, um, uh, work, we focused on uh, 1,272 children from the three sites, all come from disadvantaged backgrounds, so low uh, social economic status, they're all in government schools, and in year four. So this is not developmental data, this is just from year four. And uh, you can actually see um, that there is the, um, the age range uh, is what I was talking about before, that there are lots of overage children. So we expect the children to be between um, seven and nine, let's say. Uh, and, and these children are between eight and 12 in Delhi, seven to 15 in Patna, and the same in, in uh, Hyderabad, okay? So um, we have the fact of age, the factor of age that might play a role. Um, we've got, uh, we tested children, we asked children whether they speak one or more languages at home and what these languages were. So um, of the Delhi children, 64% claimed that they spoke only one language at home and 36% said that they spoke more languages and they named the language. Okay? And you can actually see that in Hyderabad, we get a lot more balance between monolingual and bilingual children, but multilingual children compared to Patna, for example, which is, as I said, you know, the, the rural, the more rural uh, area where you get 70% monolingual children, 30% bilingual. Now that difference doesn't, that, that distinction does not tell you actually what language uh, the children speak at home, whether it is a majority language or the minority language. So we also looked at how many of the children were minority language speakers in each of these groups, okay? And what you can see is that in Patna, only 3% claimed to be minority language speakers, 97% were speakers of Hindi. Whereas in Hyderabad, 30% of children were minority language speakers. Okay. And that means that 265 children in total were minority language speakers, and that these are some of the minority languages they spoke. Um, and of course, these children so these children, the minority language speakers, they're educated in a language they don't speak at home. And needless to say that none of these children had English 
as a home language. Okay. Um, we used uh, the Acer uh, literacy tool. Uh, this is a, a tool that has been used, as I said uh, before, by Pratham um, across India. So although it is not a standardized literacy uh, instrument, it is actually very widely used. Um, and it consists of uh, several components. So uh, letter naming, single word reading, sentence reading, passage reading, and we added comprehension questions. So the ACER tool itself is a decoding. It, it tests decoding, okay? We wanted to add uh, comprehension questions to have a more, let's say, global view of, of literacy. So these are examples from uh, word reading from the tool and um, a story, story reading. And we uh, asked uh, um, two questions. An example is uh, this question here. So we uh, run the analysis and we had as dependent variables the performance on each of these uh, subtasks, uh, the subcomponents of the literacy tool, including the comprehension questions. And as I said, the literacy test was both in English, but also in Hindi for uh, the children that had Hindi as a majority language. And in Hyderabad, it was Telugu. And uh, we used as independent variables the medium of instruction in the school and the site, you know, which of the three sites uh, the children were. Um, and we, added, uh, we had additional analysis that investigated the effects of multilingualism and speaking a minority language. Now, despite the fact that we had um, no, uh, we had this, this large age range, uh, there was no influence of age on the literacy scores, okay? So uh, age did not seem to play a role. Now, when you look at uh, literacy in Hindi, okay, so this is how well they could read Hindi, the children from Delhi and the children from Patna, um, depending also on whether they were going to an English medium school or a Hindi medium school. And what we find is that actually Hindi literacy, regardless of the medium of instruction, was, was actually quite good. They had very high scores on letter reading uh, and the performance decreased as we expected with uh, when the difficulty of reading increased. So the lowest performance was on, on story reading. Um, interestingly, those children that went to a Hindi uh, medium of instruction in school had better Hindi literacy than those that went to English medium of instruction school. But that difference was only on story reading. There was no significant difference in, in reading comprehension. Okay. And there was an effect of city, which was the, way, the opposite way of what we expected. So the Patna children from the more disadvantaged, let's say, rural area, were actually reading better uh, at the story level than the Delhi children, but there was no significant difference in reading comprehension. When you look at literacy in English, uh, in English medium, Hindi medium, and Telugu medium schools, because remember, even those children that go to Hindi medium or Telugu medium school, they still have English, right? They have English as a subject in the class. Um, and what we see here, if you compare it to this one, uh, is a, a striking uh, decline. So you can see letters are okay, but words, paragraph, story reading are really um, very poor, okay, for children who, are, uh, who have English, let's say, as a subject or as a medium of instruction. The, uh, the poorest results come from comprehension, where you actually see that the comprehension levels in English uh, are very low. There is, an there is an expected you know, pattern here where the children who are educated in English medium actually performed better on story reading okay, than the children in a regional language medium. Okay? But there was also an effect of city. So Hyderabad children actually performed better on story reading than the other two groups. And you remember from the classroom observations that in Hyderabad we had more English, let's say, input uh, in the class than in Delhi, uh, but there was no significant difference in comprehension. So it looks like it's not, it's not really an effect of, of the input here. Um, whatever input, whatever effects of the input we can see, they are mostly on decoding skills, being better at decoding, but comprehension does not seem to improve. 
Uh, and as we know, comprehension, reading comprehension is the ultimate aim of uh, reading. When you look at uh, the components in English, of literacy in English, um, and we compare children who come from a monolingual background with those from a multilingual background, we see that there are positive effects throughout. Okay, so the multilingual children coming from multilingual households had actually some sort of advantage uh, in uh, decoding uh, in English. Okay, and here when we're talking about multilingualism, remember English is not one of the languages that are spoken at home. So these are children who speak different languages and they go to school and learn English, how to read and, and, uh, and write in English and uh, they have some sort of advantage here. Now talking about the double divide that we saw, you know, the children that speak actually a minority language rather than the majority language, what we see is that across components in reading in the regional language, um, these children seem to underperform, okay, so minority language children seem to score lower across all components of uh, literacy in uh, uh, Telugu or in uh, Hindi, okay? So the double divide is there, okay? And minority language children are actually more disadvantaged uh, educate, being educated in the regional language or in English uh, compared to um, uh, majority language children. And actually, if you focus a little bit on uh, uh, the interaction between speaking a minority language and whether you come from a monolingual or a bilingual household, what we actually see across the components of reading is that uh, the monolingual children do seem to, let's say, underperform consistently uh, compared to bilingual or multilingual children. But this is uh, not evident regardless of whether uh, they, they speak the majority language at home or a minority language at home. So you can actually see that minority language children who are monolingual are even disadvantaged, they score lowest uh, in uh, three of the five components um, compared to the other three groups, okay? So uh, being a minority language speaker and being educated in a language which is not your home language has uh, you know, a, a more cumulative negative effect uh, to development of literacy. So um, what we see uh, from, for this question is that the majority of children who read the text in a regional language were able to answer the reading comprehension questions. Um, but there is a discrepancy in the performance across the cities and that has to do with language policy, but it also has to do with the amount of input uh, that we saw as a difference between Hyderabad and Delhi. In Patna, there was no uh, English anyway. So uh, let's look at the, let's turn to the uh, second question that I wanted to address uh, today, which is um, what the effect of multilingualism in the society, so contextual multilingualism, what we usually call linguistic diversity is on cognitive uh, abilities. So we looked at uh, effects on, on cognitive tasks and cognition, uh, and we uh, looked at factors like city, socioeconomic status, um, multilingualism in the home. But for this uh, uh, study, we compared the two urban sites, uh, Delhi and Hyderabad only. So you can see what the, the participants are here. So we have a total of 687 participants. Um, a relative balance between boys and girls, again, the overage children are here, uh, the mean age, uh, medium of instruction, um, differences, and school side. I haven't talked about the difference in the school sites uh, in this talk because that was another aspect that we looked at. I said that all the children were from disadvantaged uh, backgrounds, um, but we had uh, two groups uh, of children. There were children who were uh, slum dwellers, okay, so they lived in slums and the schools they went to um, attracted, you know, children from that area. Uh, so these children were in more disadvantaged conditions, let's say. Um, um, slum dwellers are supposed to be in conditions of extreme deprivation. Um, and there were other children who were also from poor socioeconomic, you know, from, from uh, 
uh, low socioeconomic background, uh, but they were not uh, living in slums, okay? So they were uh, in uh, uh, non-slum areas. And um, so there is variation within low socioeconomic status, which we were trying to capture uh, as to whether it had an effect on children's performance. So when we were trying to look at linguistic diversity, um, it, it was very difficult for us to come up with a, with a way of measuring it. And, and of course, the first thing we need to understand is what we mean by uh, diversity. Okay, so the, in, this, uh, in this graph, uh, what you can see is a, a population of three in each case. Um, but you can actually see that in this population of three, the nature of linguistic diversity varies. So if you assume that these bubbles are um, really languages, okay, you can see that, for example, in this, uh, in this group, uh, they share, let's say, a language, okay, the three individuals, but there is one who is multilingual. If you look at this group, they're all bilingual, but they share a language. And uh, similarly, you can find, you know, this is the least diverse group, okay, but you can find variations of diversity. So it's not just a um, one or zero for diversity, you can find different combinations. And we were trying to capture that along with socioeconomic status. And so we looked at, we have uh, <clears throat> the child language questionnaire that we used, which had sections on socioeconomic status and social linguistic diversity. So in the questions that were related to socioeconomic status, we had questions like whether the parents work and what sort of, uh, of work do they do? Uh, how many rooms do you have in your home? What gadgets do you have in your home? Um, which of these gadgets do you have? Where do you get your drinking water from? Is it from the tap in the home and tap outside? So there are, um, uh, let's say, uh, context specific questions that we needed to ask to figure out what the uh, socioeconomic status of these children was, because what we had was a top down distinction between uh, slum dwellers and non slum dwellers. Okay? So that was uh, the part of socioeconomic status. And then we wanted to test, uh, to measure social linguistic diversity. So we had uh, three questions in this, uh, three sections in this questionnaire um, that were asking about um, the diversity in terms of age, gender, and language of uh, individuals that the child was meeting on a daily basis, okay? And in, in three different contexts. So in the school context, okay? in the family because it is very common in India to live in uh, extended, extended families okay? uh, and in the community. And I have to say that, you know, in the community besides school and family, this is something that has to do with uh, the fact that many of the children um, in India uh, actually work uh, after school. So uh, they are bound or help their parents in the market and so on. Uh, and so they are bound to meet uh, other people regularly who have different profiles in terms of uh, age, gender, and language. So a higher score uh, here would again mean higher uh, social linguistic diversity measured across these three variables, age, gender, and language. And the cognitive tasks we use were first the ravens, uh, which I assume many of you know, so it is a, a measure of uh, nonverbal um, intelligence. Um, it is more of a problem solving exercise, as you can see here. Um, and we also measured uh, updating skills, which is a complex, uh, it's the two back task, which uh, measures uh, attention, updating, and inhibition. And uh, I don't know how familiar you are with this, but the idea is that if the number you're looking at is the same as the number you saw two digits back, then you're supposed to press a button. If it's not, uh, then you don't press anything, okay? So um, this is, uh, let's say, a complex working memory task. Now, when we look at the results of the scores from the questionnaires on social linguistic diversity and socioeconomic status, what we see is that we have, um, uh, the social linguistic diversity scores showed, you know, that there is, um, some distribution here, but most of the children had actually quite diverse contexts in which they lived. 
And when you look at the socioeconomic um, score, they also go towards, uh, they cluster more towards the uh, higher end of the uh, socioeconomic um, uh, scale. Now remember, this is within the underprivileged, okay? So it is variation within children who are not, um, uh, who are from low socioeconomic status. When we try to look at how bilingualism or multilingualism interacts with these two uh, factors, uh, social linguistic diversity and uh, socioeconomic status, we see that actually there is a lot of overlap here, right? So um, there is overlap in the social linguistic diversity scores. So here you find both bilinguals and monolinguals, and this is the purple areas that you see here. Um, monolinguals would be uh, with uh, blue and the bilinguals with this uh, lighter color. So you can see that the bilinguals, there are more bilinguals, let's say in the, on the higher, in the upper end of the social linguistic diversity score, but there is also uh, a lot of overlap uh, here. Uh, well, why? Well, because obviously in India, uh, you, you don't find, you don't expect to find a, a direct, um, let's say, a causal relation between social linguistic diversity and bilingualism in the individual because the whole uh, country is uh, multilingual in the context of multilingual. Um, but when we also look at the socioeconomic uh, status score, uh, and the distinction between slum and non-slum, we actually did find a lot of overlap here as well. And so uh, we could not trust that distinction um, because at least with the measure that we had for socioeconomic status, there was a, a, a lot of overlap between the children. So when we look at the uh, relationship between bilingualism and these factors um, that have to, and, and performance in cognitive skills, what we found is that there was a positive effect of bilingualism on the Ravens task. So children who came from bilingual backgrounds, bilingual households, actually had a higher uh, score, a significantly higher score than uh, children from monolingual uh, households in the Ravens task, and the two back as well, okay? So there was, uh, the, here there is evidence for an advantage of coming from uh, a bilingual household, um, I have to say, though, that these children, a lot of the monolingual children, children coming from monolingual households, actually go to schools where English is taught, right? So they are bilingual in essence, you know, they do have exposure to another language. Um, but what we are measuring here is the difference between a uh, number of home languages and performance in the cognitive. There was an interesting uh, interaction between social linguistic diversity and bilingualism, which we didn't expect uh, so much. I mean, there was a very strong correlation between being bilingual and being in a social linguistically diverse environment, which is uh, as we expected. But what we found here was that there was a significant interaction between bilingualism and social linguistic diversity. And that was mostly due to monolingual children being in high social linguistically diverse environment and as a result they performed better in uh, the Ravens task. Okay so these are Ravens scores and social linguistic diversity score and what you find is that you know with higher um, uh, social linguistic diversity if you are monolingual you actually uh, have an advantage uh, in terms of performance in that task. When it comes to um, the influence of all these uh, factors that we were looking at, uh, and uh, th these factors, as I said, were socioeconomic status, gender, age, city, uh, medium of instruction, and uh, school sites, sl slum or non-slum, what we found in the uh, updating task, in the two-back task, was uh, an effect of medium of instruction, which actually shows that children going to Hindi medium schools uh, actually outperformed uh, children in Telugu medium schools. Now, this is, we couldn't explain that, and I think we don't have a clear answer as to why this is the case, but um, a major difference between uh, children in Delhi and children in Hyderabad is that in children in Telugu medium school, a lot of them were, if you remember, minority language speakers. So they were not really familiar with um, uh, 
the regional language, Telugu, which was not the case in Delhi. In Delhi, uh, all the children um, had Hindi in some form at home. Um, in the, the Raven's task, there was only an effect of the city, so children from, from Delhi actually outperformed children from, from Hyderabad. Again, to some extent, this has to do, might have to do, uh, with um, the, um, you know, with how many children uh, actually were familiar with the, the school language uh, in each case, but also the fact that in Hyderabad there is more um, poor uh, population than in Delhi. Okay, so there are more, uh, let's say, um, the number of slums in Hyderabad has increased in the last few years, according to government reports, and uh, the overall um, uh, living status of the, of, the, of the population in Hyderabad is lower uh, than in Delhi. So, uh, a brief summary and conclusion. Um, it seems to be the case on the base of the data presented today, and of course this is only a fraction of the data we have uh, from the project. Um, it seems that multilingualism in the individual, that is the languages that an individual learns, let's say, from birth at home, seems to be beneficial for cognition, but also for literacy, literacy skills in an additional language, okay? Because remember, we found this advantage of children reading in English, children who came from multilingual households, they had an advantage reading, uh, decoding in English compared to monolingual children. When it comes to multilingualism in the society, linguistic diversity, it seems that it contributes to monolinguals' cognitive skills. And I think this is a very important finding, particularly for um, the global north, because uh, there is, um, at least in the UK, um, a misunderstanding or misconception that uh, um, monolingual children speaking English at home should not be uh, in the school environment where um, you know there are a lot of migrant children who uh, who speak other languages okay because that level of linguistic diversity might actually um, uh, challenge the uh, the level of literacy and academic performance of the monolingual children and i think that the results that we have here just open the question uh, for you know to our uh, our societies, the Western societies, to actually uh, look more at uh, the advantages that linguistic diversity may offer to uh, monolinguals. Um, clearly, we found what has been found before, that children educated in a language they don't speak at home are disadvantaged in literacy development. So we have recommended, uh, and we, we, you know, one of the impact uh, the case of our project is that, uh, you know, children should be educated in the first years, at least of primary school uh, or throughout the primary school in a language they speak and understand. And I have to say, that, you know, that these results uh, have to be uh, always considered from the perspective of the population that we looked at. So we are looking at children from disadvantaged backgrounds with limited or no home literacy support and whose skill, uh, school skills are expected to develop in school only, because out of school there is not much support. Okay, so um, it is not, uh, these are not results that should be uh, generalized um, across, uh, across uh, populations, across uh, contexts, etc. It is very important uh, to balance this uh, when controlling for you know home uh, home literacy and home literacy support for these children um so in all what we propose is the multilingualism has to be considered uh, reconsidered uh, as a form of language experience which takes into account linguistic diversity not only in the individual who happens to be bilingual or multilingual but also because of the uh, uh, of the context in which um, she grows up or uh, she lives in his race. And thank you very much um, for your attention. Um, and these are some references from the project which I can uh, share with you. And this is a relatively recent picture from February 
2020, um, where you can actually see, well, you can see Theo, you can see Janine, uh, you can see Ajit Mohanty, uh, Lina, uh, a lot of our RAs, Amy Lightfoot from British Council, and Anusha from uh, Cambridge. Thank you very much.